Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the Court. The federal contraceptive mandate makes it impossible for individuals to purchase health insurance that excludes contraceptive coverage. Each of the plaintiffs in this case has alleged that this inflicts injury in fact by limiting their available options on the health insurance market. The word impossible is in the complaint. Impossible, yes. But is it impossible or it just creates market forces that mean that insurers are less likely to offer it? We've alleged in the complaint, Judge Higginson, that it's impossible at this point for the plaintiffs to purchase health insurance. Not that it's necessarily impossible for insurers to offer it. But what we've alleged at this point in the proceedings, and because this is on Rule 12b-6, all allegations have to be accepted as true, we've alleged that it's impossible for our clients to purchase health insurance right now despite the injunction in the Ad Against AIDS Law, which purports to allow insurers to offer contraceptive-free health insurance to religious objectors. So that's the allegation of the complaint, and that needs to be accepted as true at this stage of the proceedings. We may or may not be able to prove that later in the case, but that comes at the summary judgment stage or after discovery. So at this point, we've sufficiently alleged each of the three elements of Article III standing, injury in fact, causation, and redressability. The district court held that the claims asserted by Mr. Leal and Mr. Von Dolan were barred by res judicata, all of their claims. But I'm going to stop you just because the standing has a lot of fun, tricky issues embedded in it. Yes. I guess, is your, I guess we can, it would be helpful to go through all three aspects of standing quickly. In terms of sufficient injury, isn't still the argument one of economic modeling, that it's, you're predicting that the insurers, even though they're free to offer this smaller insurance pool, they just won't? We are predicting that. That's correct. Now, on the issue of economic injury that Your Honor suggested, that's relevant only with respect to Ms. Armstrong, because she's a non-religious objector. For Leal and Von Dolan, it doesn't matter whether premiums go up or down based on contraceptive coverage. So there's debate right now whether the preventive care mandates actually increase premiums or decrease premiums. But if I remember the complaint, the theory was, well, we know that they would offer ones without complicity. That's the way I'm thinking of the two religious objectors, because they offered those before. That's correct. That's what we've alleged in the complaint. Because these policies existed on the market prior to the Affordable Care Act, we've alleged plausibly that they would be offered again. It's a plausible interpretation, but it runs a little bit against the theory that you're relying on, the injury theory from Hellerstedt, because it's backward looking. It's not saying there's some new facts that have created this. We know from the past. Well, I think, Your Honor, the new facts that we're relying on is the fact that the Dayot injunction was insufficient to restore the availability of contraceptive-free coverage. Right. But if we assume race judicata is the traditional formula, it would seem to me it's the nuclear fact that existed when you first sued and prevailed in the RFRA case at the beginning. Right. It's just you didn't anticipate you needed a broader injunction. That's correct. That's exactly right. We didn't know at the time of Dayot that the limited relief sought, which essentially mirrored the Trump administration's religious objection. But I'm interrupting both because I know how well you understand this, and so it's just trying to get down the nub of my uncertainty. But you did know because you pled it. You pled, look, they would have given it in the past. Well, they would have given it in the past if there were no contraceptive mandate at all. What we didn't know at the time of Dayot against Azar is what would happen in a world in which you have the contraceptive mandate, but with the Trump administration's religious objections, because that world had never existed before. We did have, prior to the Affordable Care Act, no mandate at all. Okay. What we didn't know at the time of Dayot was what would happen when you have this halfway world where you have the mandate, but with very broad religious exemptions. And when the Department of Justice responds, California v. Texas, your primary answer is that's at the summary judgment stage? Correct. That's correct. So we will eventually have to prove, in order to survive a motion for summary judgment, we'll need some evidence that there would actually be insurers out there who would offer contraceptive-free policies without the mandate. And wasn't that a standing case, California v. Texas? California, indeed, yes. It was a standing case. That's right. All right. Well, you also have, it seems to me the complaint talks about the market, the available market. You also plead in your complaint the Texas contraceptive equity law as the subject of some redress. What is the status of your claim against, 
that, because that's not involved in Dayot, is that correct? Correct, that's right. Dayot was solely a challenge to the federal contraceptive ban. Okay. Now, and, good. And, and Your Honor's correct, there are state law issues as well that may affect the availability of contraceptive-free coverage on the market, because Texas has, it's not a contraceptive mandate, but it's called a contraceptive equity law. Right. Where, but but in, your, in your, you're here today, and in your briefing, you're talking about the ACA mandate. Correct. So Judge Kaczmarek severed the two claims. He did not think we could litigate the legality of the state law contraceptive equity law in federal court. So those claims were remanded to state court. They're not at issue on appeal. So we have to litigate the two separately. That does create some interesting wrinkles on the Article III standing question. Yeah. I think it would have been cleaner for us if we could challenge both at once. That's why we tried to challenge both in the same proceeding. But with respect to contraception— In the complaint, do you ever say the TCEL is a lesser obstacle? I looked at the complaint pretty closely. It seems like you're saying they're overlapping, not intertwined obstacles. Well, we didn't suggest that they were identical in the complaint. And I thought we made very clear how we pleaded the contraceptive equity law, and we attached the text of that law to our complaint. It's not saying that employers and insurers have to offer contraceptive coverage. It just says if you have coverage for prescription drugs, you have to cover contraceptive pills on the same terms. Right, but in multiple paragraphs, 23, 29, 36, I think it's a fair reading to say you're saying you need to remove two independent obstacles. And then in the relief, you're saying we even might want an order to the director of the Department of Insurance. Oh, that's right, Your Honor. And the reason— So then you do run into this, like the Sixth Circuit white case, I'm sure, the cockfighting case. You run into the predicament of can you trace it or even get redressability by just knocking out the ACCA with the appointments clause non-delegation argument. Right. So that, again, this is a complication that arises because we have to litigate the two separately based on what the district court held. But the contraceptive equity law doesn't require coverage of contraception. It will still be possible if this court were to enjoin the enforcement of the federal contraceptive mandate, it would be possible for insurers in Texas to offer contraceptive-free health insurance for two reasons. First, the state law doesn't cover self-insured employers. States aren't allowed to regulate self-insured plans under ERISA. So with respect to self-insured employers, they will have the autonomy if there's an injunction against the federal contraceptive mandate because they're not affected at all by state law contraception requirements. But secondly, private insurers can still offer contraceptive-free health insurance if they drop off coverage for prescription drugs. Or they could offer contraception coverage with deductibles and co-pays that mirror whatever deductibles and co-pays they impose on other prescription drugs. So that will still alleviate the injury. And to get back to your question, Judge Higginson, to show redressability, we don't need to prove that every single injury will be redressed. It's enough if we can show that there will be a remedy from this court that redresses our alleged injury, at least in part. And if we can at least allege that, because we're still at the pleading stage, if we can at least allege that, that's all we need to do to survive a motion to dismiss at this point in the litigation. Now, later on, when we have to get factual proof, things will become more complicated. And all these questions— Was that Sixth Circuit white decision a motion to dismiss or summary judgment? I don't remember, Your Honor. I haven't read that. Do you accept that law, though, that if there were two equal and independent obstacles, you wouldn't, or would you push back? I think it really depends on the facts of each case, because there could be a situation in which a ruling from a court that enjoins one of two separate independent obstacles could still make it, in theory, a little easier for the plaintiffs to overcome the second obstacle. It's going to be a fact-intensive inquiry. But I think, in theory, if I could just take a step back and offer a hypothetical, if there were two separate laws, one federal and one state, that said exactly the same thing, like we had a state law version of the contraceptive mandate that mirrored everything in the federal provision, I think we would have major problems at the 12B6 stage. Because once we are told by the district court that we can't challenge both at once, it's going to be very hard for us to show addressability if there were an independent state law that required exactly the same thing that we're not able to challenge. And remind me, in the complaint, did you make it clear that you're actually one is a lesser, they are not co-equal? We did say in the complaint that Texas has a contraceptive equity law. I know you described, you titled it, but did you make the argument you're making now? I don't know if we went to that level of detail, Judge Higginson, but we certainly said, because again, when we wrote the complaint, we were assuming at the time we'd be able to challenge both at once. Only later in the case did we get the ruling from the district court that said that the state law claims couldn't proceed. So when we wrote it, we weren't actually trying to plead as carefully as what I'm saying in court today, because we weren't expecting to be in this type of situation. You're still challenging the TCEL in state court? In state court, yes. But we are, 
we haven't moved very quickly, uh, and for, for obvious reasons. We'd like to get a ruling, just like in state court, it would be easier for us if we can litigate the issue in state court once we have a ruling from the federal court on our challenge to the federal mandate, because similar standing issues will arise in state court. They'll be asking the same questions that your honors are asking, but just in the opposite direction. How can you challenge this state law when there's this independent federal requirement? And it's actually a more serious problem for us in state court. So we are deliberately slow walking the state court. Insurers challenging either? You would think insurers, if they really could offer a policy, are you, are you aware of whether they're challenging? I'm, I'm not aware of any challenge by an insurance company. And, and I, I share your I know you want to get to other issues. And yes, We've asked certainly. you a lot about standing. Um, mm -hmm. I might add five minutes to each side just because we haven't even let you get to the merits and res judicata. Um, is, that, is that fine? Could you, did you, could you add five minutes to each side, please? Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Yes, and jurisdiction always comes first. Now, with respect to the merits, there are two questions. One is the res judicata holding of the court. The other issue is the court's holding on the merits of our non-delegation challenge. The district court never reached the appointments clause issue correctly because he held first that Leal and Von Dolan could not allege appointments clause because of the res judicata problem. But secondly, with respect to Ms. Armstrong, she voluntarily dismissed her appointments clause claim. So the only two issues before this court are res judicata and non-delegation. So with res judicata, there's the question of Hellerstedt, whether we can get around the res judicata obstacle by relying on Hellerstedt's somewhat departure from the traditional rules of res judicata. But we also contend in our brief and in the district court that we can surmount even the traditional test for res judicata, which asks whether the claims in this case arise from the same common nucleus of operative fact as the claims in Dayot against Azar. If I could begin with Hellerstedt. With respect to Hellerstedt, I only pause because wouldn't we want to wait for the, the, the panel that heard argument last April, no matter what, if we were reaching res judicata? Probably, in, 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 all, honest, in all candor, Judge, Judge Higginson, because we don't know yet what the panel and they will do. If they vacate the injunction, then the res judicata issue goes away. Although I think we would still probably pursue further proceedings, perhaps in Bonk or perhaps at the Supreme Court. If, and I say the word we because, in disclosure, I represent the plaintiff in, in the audience that he saw. But we're still waiting for the ruling. There may still be proceedings, however the court rules, before the en banc court or the Supreme Court of the United States. So I do think it would be prudent to wait for the panel. I don't know whether I want to say that the court should wait for two years if this goes to the Supreme Court of the United States. But, but certainly I think the panel's had the decision for eight months, and, and I think the, they will issue a ruling probably before this court does. So uh, if, if the Dayot injunction is vacated, then the res judicata issues are, are moved. But I, I, I'm, I'm arguing this on the facts that exist today, which is the injunction is in existence, and I'll assume, without being presumptuous or trying to predict how the panel will rule, just given today the injunction's in effect. And res judicata is still a bar. We don't have to wait for the conclusion of direct appeals for res judicata to kick in. It's, it's still a bar because the district court issued its decision. So on, on the Hellerstedt question, Hellerstedt holds that, first, you can litigate a second as applied challenge, even if you litigated a facial challenge to the exact same statute. Hellerstedt even went further to allow the plaintiffs in that case to bring a second facial challenge to a law that they had challenged facially in the first go around. Now the district court held that Hellerstedt's holding is limited to abortion cases, but we don't think that's supported by the language of Hellerstedt itself. Hellerstedt relies on the phrase important human values. And the way we construe the Hellerstedt decision is that when important human values are at stake, a litigant can bring a second claim that might normally be barred under the common nucleus of operative fact test if they plausibly allege that there were new factual developments that came into existence after the first judgment was rendered. And that's exactly what we're pleading here, which is that at the time of Dayot, we did not know what would happen if the Dayot injunction were to issue and restrain the enforceability of the federal contraceptive mandate. We assumed in Dayot that insurers would start issuing contraceptive free health insurance policies again, but they haven't done that, even though the Dayot injunction has been in effect now for about two years. So the best, your best reading, not the district courts, because he had extended discussion mm -hmm. that at points seemed to be a little discursive to me about Hellerstedt, but your best reading of it, it is it does or doesn't adjust Fifth Circuit law and I'm specifically thinking we've got the Houston case and we've got Colonial Oaks. One of them was after Hellerstedt. Right. And it looked to me like we don't see that it affected much of a change. I don't think it did change the law outside the context of important human values. And I, I think even the Hellerstedt majority would agree with this. They were not purporting to junk 
But you're not surrendering that this case relates to, since it's Greek religion, equally human values. Exactly. That, that, that's our distinction, Judge Higginson. And again, we're not in any way suggesting that Hellerstedt overruled the cases of this court that applied the traditional test for res judicata. Even I think I agreed with your brief that just about every case we see affects human values. Yeah, and, and, the, and the district court made that point as well. This is a very slippery test. And, but this is, this is the language the Supreme Court gave us, and, and we have to do the best that, that we can with it. Did you plead, though, specifically that, that there are market forces that weren't reasonably predictable? We didn't plead that, but I don't think we need to do that in a complaint. Normally, complaints don't have to anticipate affirmative defenses like res judicata. Right, but Hellerstadt really was the sort of the world of hospitals offering services had shrunk. True. There were fact yeah. adjustments that were accepted and obvious, not disputed. Here, here it's still all economic modeling. Yeah, so in Hellerstedt, you have a similar type of law where it's restricting the availability of a type of healthcare service. I guess here it's restricting the availability of health insurance, but it's similar. Market forces are at work in both types of cases, right? And the Supreme Court in Hellerstedt essentially says, even though they never really address common nucleus of operative fact, but they just say that because you are alleging a claim that relies on new factual allegations, new factual evidence, we're going to say that's not, quote, the very same claim as the prior one. There's, there, there's definitely tension between Hellerstedt and the traditional test for res judicata. And, and courts, I think, are understandably reluctant to extend Hellerstedt. Is there any circuit that's applied Hellerstedt in the direction you are urging us to? I haven't found one yet, to, in, in all candor to the court. I haven't seen that. But Hellerstedt, and that's essentially how the district court treated Hellerstedt. Essentially, it was a, a, a sui generis situation for abortion only. And that, the district court wrote a thoughtful opinion. We just think it's somewhat cynical to say that there's a separate test for res judicata that applies only in abortion cases, and then a different- Counsel, even if in DEOC the injunction is vacated, the 2017 rule is still in place. Is that correct? And nothing that has superseded that since that time. That's right. It would still be in effect as an agency rule, even though it would no longer be in effect as a court-ordered injunction. So it would not change the set of facts on the ground with respect to contraceptive- When you began your remarks, I think you were saying that the 2017 rule, if I understood you correctly, is not sufficient to afford relief as of today. That would still be our position. That's right. But at least in that situation, we wouldn't encounter a res judicata obstacle. And the problem that we had in the district court was we litigated this issue in DEOC. If that injunction is vacated, we would have the same grievances with respect to the 2017 religious exemptions that would remain in effect as an agency rule, but our claim would be there's still a problem under RFRA because even though these rules were designed to give insurers the ability to offer contraceptive free health insurance to religious objectors, they're not doing it. And I think the reason is that there just aren't enough individual consumers who are categorically opposed to contraception. It's a small slice of the U.S. population. It would be- But that's a market argument, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it's a market argument. But with respect to the world prior to the ACA, there were lots of non-religious people who didn't need contraceptive coverage. So the market was willing to offer it because you have people who are past their childbearing years, people who- all sorts of reasons why people may not need the contraceptive coverage and they don't want to pay extra for it. Those people can't get health insurance that excludes contraception under the agency rules because they only protect the religious objectors. So that's what our lawsuit's trying to do. It's trying to protect not just the people like Leal and Brandolin, you know, the Catholics who oppose contraception in all situations, but people like Ms. Armstrong who just- they don't need it because she just has no need for contraceptive coverage. And I see my time is short. If I could maybe pivot very briefly to the non-delegation issue. Did you cite Big Time Babes? No, I didn't cite it. But there was heavy reliance on it by the government. Yes. And it is a Fifth Circuit case. It is a Fifth Circuit case. Which I have particular familiarity with. No, that's right. That's right. And again, our position with respect to that case and with respect to Hellerstedt's impact on the law of the Fifth Circuit is that the court should still apply the traditional test for res judicata unless the litigant is invoking this idea of important human values. And Your Honor asked earlier, are there other circuit courts that are taking this approach? And, you know, there haven't been any cases that I found, but at the same time, I haven't seen cases where litigants are trying to make this argument either. So the paucity of authority could simply be because litigants aren't trying to extend Hellerstedt into new situations. And maybe it's just because this phrase, important human values, is very loose and could be read, I suppose, to include every case because what case doesn't? But Big Time Babes is a non-delegation case. I'm sorry, the non-delegation issue, not res judicata. Yeah. So non-delegation, yeah. And their heavy reliance was on our most recent statement as to 
how we haven't seen in 80 years or whatever it is. No, it, it's totally right. I mean, Professor Sunstein, I think, said it better than anyone, where he said the non-delegation doctrine has had one good year. And So with 10 seconds, what's your best argument on non-delegation? <laughs> it's similar to what happened, I think, with the Commerce Clause jurisprudence prior to Lopez. This is the one. Which is, well, it's just the Supreme Court hasn't completely checked out, right? And even with respect to the Commerce Clause after 1937, they were highly deferential. May I continue yes, this sir. sentence? They were highly deferential to congressional enactments, but they never actually got to the point of saying, we're washing our hands of this. It's a non-justiciable political question. We're going to endorse the political safeguards of federalism theory. They haven't done that with respect to the Commerce Clause. They haven't done that with respect to non-delegation either. And until the Supreme Court, I think, actually takes that step and just says, we're scrapping the doctrine or we're instructing courts not to get involved in policing the boundary, there has to at least be some situation in which there is a universe of statutes, however small that might be, that falls on the impermissible side of the line. And if this one isn't it, it's hard to, for us to imagine a, a statute that would violate it. And maybe I can say more in rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honors. Ms. Klein? May it please the court, Elisa Klein for the federal government. Um, I'd actually like to start with the big time vapes question and then I'll circle back to jurisdiction because I just want to make clear why this is not the one. Right. And the Supreme Court, obviously we're familiar with the Little Sisters language, but let me explain what the Supreme Court didn't do, which is the big time vapes, Gundy, American trucking type analysis that the court does in a non-delegation case. And if you were to do it here, looking at the statutory provision, the full provision, 300 GG Jeffs 13, while you would start with paragraph four, which is the women's provision, you would read the cross-reference to paragraph one. So what has Congress instructed HRSA to do? What should these guidelines be? Such additional preventive care and services not described in paragraph one. And as Justice Scalia in the American Trucking versus Whitman case um, recognized, when you've got terms with a customary usage, those are incorporated and provide guidance for an agency for purposes of non-delegation doctrine. So here, when Congress is telling HRSA, just basically fill the gaps, such additional preventive care and screenings that are not otherwise described in one, you look to what the Preventive Services Task Force has been doing since 1984. I think you, I would say, move on to the other arguments. It's, it's a creative suggestion that it was the Fifth Circuit that announced Lopez and that went up on Commerce Clause, so we could be the ones to rejuvenate. But I, I think the other arguments are more important to reach. So shall I turn to the standing, Your Honor? I, that would help me to start at the beginning. Okay, I'll turn back to the standing. So on standing, there are a number of independent problems. First is that as we read the complaint, the allegation is that Texas law is an independent barrier to the plans that these three individuals want. And just to read an example, um, paragraph 33, which is quoted in plaintiff's reply brief at three, the federal defendant's enforcement of the contraceptive mandate, along with the state defendant's enforcement of the Texas law, gives the citation, make it impossible for the plaintiffs to purchase health insurance that excludes this unwanted and unneeded coverage for contraceptives. We do not read the complaint to say that any of these three individuals wanted a plan with no prescription drug coverage. That would be a quite extraordinary um, allegation. Even if they're duplicative though, the, the logic in some of the case law is remove one brick, that helps you lessen the second brick. Um, so, the, so if we will, this is, what's your best case at the motion to dismiss stage that just because you face two equal independent obstacles, you can't even attack one? Well, so this is as a matter of law. So, for example, the Supreme Court's decision in Rene versus Geary, 501 U.S. at 319, there it was talking about two, Justice Kennedy was talking about two independent provisions of California law, but the principle is the same. He put it in terms of standing and said, we're, it's you know, not at all clear that the challenge provision, if removed, would actually have a concrete effect because there was another provision of California law that um, had the same consequence. And here, taking the complaint as pled by the plaintiffs, they allege that the Texas law together with the, the federal contraceptive coverage law, but that Texas law makes it impossible for these three individuals to purchase the plan they want. 
And indeed, it, from their description, the Texas law actually looks broader because the HRSA guideline, the only requirement is to cover FDA-approved contraceptives for women as prescribed, uh, for women of, with reproductive capacity as prescribed by a healthcare provider. So the plaintiffs aren't even alleging that they fall within that category. So it, this may be metaphysical, but- So this is a complaint deficiency, or is this purely a legal point that any time you've got two obstacles, you can't attack one because there's the other? Both, it's a legal point and a complaint deficiency, but they, they could not, given their accurate description of Texas law, plead around this issue. I mean, it'd be one thing if they said, I want a plan with no prescription drug coverage, then we might have a different question. We don't see that allegation in the complaint. And I'm just making the point, like giving up prescription drug coverage is a very serious thing. So you would imagine that someone would come forward and say, I am sufficiently opposed to contraceptive coverage that I would rather a plan with no prescription drug coverage. And I, I'm, I'm as a sort of a gradualist or a creature of precedent. Do you have a circuit case applying RENA in the direction you're suggesting? Yes, Your Honor. The White case, and there's also a, a Ninth Circuit case that we cited in our brief involving um, assault weapons. The other point I just want to make sure the court appreciates, because some of these issues were um, raised in the reply brief, understandably, since we raised standing in our appellee's brief. There is a separate Affordable Care Act provision, not challenged in this lawsuit, that under the essential health benefits requires insurers to cover prescription drugs. So that's 42 USC 18022 paren B. It's a little unsettling to think if the government or governments can sufficiently create a lockbox, then parties will be dismissed at the motion to dismiss stage for lack of standing. That's the discomfort I have with this law. I think it does get tricky when you dig into it. The sixth and the ninth do stand for that. Nothing getting close from the Fifth Circuit that you know offhand. Nothing that I know from the Fifth Circuit, but you know. But you have a separate argument, don't you? I mean, you probably have multiple, but on the injury, I was probing there. Yes, and so distinct from that is that these are all predictions about market forces. This is like in California versus Texas. This is based on predictions about what the regulated parties, insurance companies, would do if liberated from a particular legal requirement. And there, the prediction, it's, it's not just speculative, but it's implausible as illustrated by what happened in response to the Dayot injunction. Notwithstanding a, a class that got relief that liberated insurers from the federal contraceptive coverage requirement and not notwithstanding the last administration's exemptions, which are still on the books, um, the insurers have not offered the type of plan that the plaintiffs say they want. And this is just generally unsurprising because insurance products are not tailored to the medical needs of particular. What about just the inference from their complaint stating that before the contraceptive mandate, insurers did offer these menus and they're restricted. Doesn't it seem, therefore, that at least it's a plausible argument? So, I'm sorry, Your Honor, didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. Um, I would be interested in the factual basis for that because the complaint acknowledges that the Texas law that's been in place since 2001 has prohibited Texas insurers from offering the coverage they want. So I'm wondering if perhaps this is either not based on factual knowledge or not particular to the Texas uh, market, um, so which would be what? I think their argument would be we have to accept it at this stage and then you bring in the experts and. Well, I don't think you accept it if they were to acknowledge that this is um, not based on any factual knowledge. If this is just speculation in effect, like again, using Iqbal and Twombly, it's not enough to just allege, though it sounds in fact, that the defendants entered into an anti-competitive agreement or that Attorney General Ashcroft was the architect of a retaliatory scheme. It needs to be plausible and taking that, you know, like plausibility when you're talking about the actions of a third party. What's a good implausible third party case other than California v. Texas because that is a summary judgment stage. Can you think of one? Well, Twombly itself, the, the third parties were the defendants. Right. They were third parties. The allegation was they entered into an anti-competitive agreement and the Supreme Court said that bare assertion isn't going to be treated as the type, you know, we're not treating it as true for purposes of a motion to dismiss. And insurers aren't attacking either provision, to your knowledge? Not, no, no, not to my knowledge. 
Well, go keep, keep going. Okay, so I, I, I do want to make sure, because of its importance, that I address the non-delegation issue. And Before you do that, yes. uh, would you agree with your opponent uh, with regard to the Dayot injunction that if it's vacated, then it removes the res judicata obstacle that, you, that we have here? I'm reluctant to opine on that. We haven't briefed it, and I haven't thought about it enough. Um, and I'm not involved in the day out litigation, so I also you know, wouldn't want to speculate. Oh, but, but wasn't that one of the central factors for the judge here to say that the claims were were part of the class in day out and therefore res judicata? Yeah, absolutely, that was the basis. But I would want to know the ground on which it is vacated. Okay. Right. Armstrong's not. So I'm sorry. As to Armstrong. As the arms is your threshold standing argument, Armstrong, that's just a general grievance? Um, it's, no, it's the, the, the standing, and the reason I wasn't focusing on race judicata is because it does not apply to Armstrong. It doesn't narrow the issue. But as to the, Armstrong, what's the standing problem? As to Armstrong, the standing problem is the one that I was just describing. It's that both Texas law is an independent barrier to the plan she says she wants, that by her own account, you know, the allegation in the complaint is that she doesn't have reproductive capacity. So she actually isn't getting contraceptive coverage under the HRSA guideline. If she's getting it, it's by virtue of the Texas law. And the additional point that there's, it's implausible that insurers are going to start tailoring their products to the medical needs of individuals. That's very different from what happened, you know, in the wake of Hobby Lobby or Zubik when you were talking about group health plans where the the architect of the group plan said, if you want access to my 10,000 employees like Hobby Lobby, then here's how you design your plan. That The market forces leave room for that, but we're not aware of insurers targeting a product to the insured because the essence of insurance is it covers lots of services that an individual doesn't need. Otherwise, it would cease to be insurance. It would just be paying of um, predictable medical bills. So back to what we think of as the merits on non-delegation. Again, I just want to make sure we address that this is quite similar to big time vapes yeah. in that what Congress said was I guess I'm, I'm more worried, I mean, I think we know the non-delegation world, but, but in the, my, my panelists may want to ask more, but what about the RIFRA claim and the argument that as applied, sort of on the Hellerstadt theory, um, now new facts have emerged to show that, um, I in fact, uh, they should be able to explore requesting an injunction that extends further. So. They, they didn't bring a, a facial challenge in Dayot. I mean, it was just an as-applied RIFRA claim, and they succeeded on it. Mm -hmm. Essentially, they're saying the scope of relief didn't give us what we want because of market forces. That really doesn't map onto Hellerstedt, where you had I mean, two different race judicata issues. One was they were challenging an entirely different statutory provision, entirely distinct, the, the surgical center provision, as opposed to the admitting privileges provision. And the other was the more familiar um, principle that it's hard to prevail on a facial challenge. And normally, when the Supreme Court says that, they don't mean to foreclose an as-applied challenge. So it began as an as-applied, and then they're trying to adjust and broaden the scope. Exactly. Yeah, go ahead. OK, I just want to make sure I'm res responsive to the court. Yeah, no, you um, So just mapping the, the big time vapes analysis onto the statute that we have here. The question is, did Congress provide sufficient guideposts for HRSA to know what to do? And in that respect, by bounding the task of HRSA to identifying um, such additional preventive care and screenings not described in paragraph one, but with a special focus on women, Congress is essentially saying fill the gaps that the task force recommendations um, leave in the specialized area of women's health. And because when Congress enacted this, the Preventive Service Task Force had been operating since the 80s, so Congress would have been familiar with the usage of preventive care and screenings, and it's essentially, you look to net health benefits. So the, just the question is, you know, for any, if you think about a mammogram, it has, you know, clear potential health benefits in screening and identifying breast cancer at an early stage, but it's has been. In your brief, has there been a steady inclusion of other things? 
I'm, I'm sorry. Have there been a steady inclusion of other screening things that have to be covered? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Both the, under the preventive, if, if you look at the way the Preventive Service Task Force has operated for decades, and it's all described on their website, this is, it's going to, one way or another, you're looking for net health benefits for substantial populations. You consider medical benefits and potential medical harms, either from the screening itself or false positives. And the, if you look to the factual context of paragraph four, um, it was introduced, it's the Women's Health Amendment, introduced on the floor because of the um, concern that those task force guidelines were leaving certain gaps in the more specialized area of women's health. And so this was essentially just a directive to HRSA to using the same type of you know, expert panels, fill those gaps. And that is, in fact, what HRSA has done. If you look at you know, their recommendations and the methodology that's set out, and this is not just a self-imposed um, restriction, this is properly following the directive that Congress um, provided by saying, cross-reference one, and you know, identify those um, such additional preventive care and screenings not identified in paragraph one. Um, so in, if there were any doubt on that, the constitutional avoidance canon would also um, counsel in favor of reading it to assign HRSA the important but very limited, you know, modest task that Congress assigned to the agency. Do you, and since you may be wrapping up, but, but do you agree that, that it would be very prudent for us to wait for the DAOP panel to issue its opinion? We have no objection to that. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Mitchell. Your Honor, on the issues of standing and the issues of pleading, we do allege specifically in paragraphs 24 to 30 of our complaint how the Texas law is a contraceptive equity law and, and not a contraceptive mandate. Now, of course, we're not pleading in detail the distinctions between the two on the idea that we might only get one enjoined and not the other, because at the time we pleaded the complaint, we were challenging both the federal and the state regime, and we were describing standing on the assumption that we would get a remedy from the court that enjoins both. But if the court believes that there is a defect in pleading with respect to showing how an injunction directed solely at the federal contraceptive mandate would redress the alleged injuries of our clients, we'd, we would respectfully ask the panel to give us the opportunity to replead the issue on remand, because the district court never dismissed our complaint based on pleading defects, and normally a plaintiff does get an opportunity to replead if a court concludes that there is some lack of factual detail in the allegations of the complaint. So with respect to standing, that is our response to Ms. Klein's remarks. We also just would note, Ms. Klein suggested in her discussion with the court that we did not plead in our complaint that our clients wanted to have prescription-free contraceptive coverage. Again, we don't believe we need to plead that level of detail. We're still suffering injury, in fact, by the denial of that option on the market. And our clients would have to see what options are available to decide whether they actually would want to forego all coverage of prescription drugs in order not to have contraceptive coverage. A lot would depend on how much they would save in premiums, things of that sort. But again, more importantly, these factual details weren't pleaded at the time of the initial filing because we were challenging both the state and the federal requirements at the same time. So on the issues of those pleading issues, that's our response to, to what Ms. Klein said. Uh, on, on the non-delegation point, I, I, I agree, Judge Higginson, this is a somewhat creative maneuver, and I think the issue for the court to decide is whether it wants to act in the way the Fifth Circuit did in Lopez, where the Court of Appeals was making the issue, on the, putting the issue onto the Supreme Court's docket, or, or wait for the Supreme Court itself. There, there is language in Little Sisters that suggests that the Supreme Court may be interested in revisiting the non-delegation doctrine in this particular context, but we acknowledge that Little Sister did not go so far as to say that this violated the non-delegation doctrine. But as, as to the attack on the ACCA contraceptive mandate, the appointments clause, disagree, but it would seem to me the appointments clause and non-delegation argument, the nucleus of facts to make those arguments existed when you first filed. It's, they they it's, existed. They, they definitely existed, Judge Higginson. I think the question, though, is whether that's the same nucleus of operative fact. With respect to the nucleus of operative fact about the agency's decision about how it exercises delegated power. So on the one hand, Congress passes a statute that gives authority to the agency. 
Later, the authority exercises that delegated authority in a certain way. With the Dayot litigation, we were challenging the latter, what the executive branch did with the authority that Congress gave it. In this case, we're challenging what Congress did. At the moment they enacted the Affordable Care Act, Congress violated the Appointments Clause because they vested authority in agency officials who were not appointed in a manner consistent with Article II. And that's a different nucleus of operative fact than with but you had every relevant fact to make it. Yes, we could have made it, and I think we admit that in our brief. Yes. We could have raised it, but that's not the test for res judicata, because any time you sue a defendant, True. you can always... But, yeah. but what, we got close to saying that in Colonial Oaks. It was close to saying that, and there are cases that will suggest... You can find passages in cases that say if you could have raised it, then it's barred by res judicata, but that, that's just not right, because you can always, under Rule 18, you can bring any claim against a defendant that you have sued regardless of whether it arises out of the same nucleus of operative fact. So the, the fact that we could have brought it is not conclusive on res judicata. But the Hellerstadt changed circumstances is specific to the RIFRA claim, no? Yes, that is correct. It is specific to the RIFRA claim. We are not making that argument with respect to non-delegation or the Appointments Clause. There are no changed circumstances there because what Congress did in 2010, nothing changed between the Dayot injunction and, and today. That's correct. So we're making two different arguments on res judicata. On the changed circumstances, that's only about RIFRA. With respect to the idea that these are different nuclei of operative fact, that is an argument that is relevant only to non-delegation and appointments clause, because we're saying essentially there's a different decision Congress made that's separate. It's a separate nucleus from the decision the executive branch made in terms of what it did with that delegated authority. Terrific. All right, and if the court has any further questions in my yep. remaining 10 seconds, I'll answer them. But otherwise, we'll rest on our brief. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Counsel.